The stench of scorched fur hangs heavily in the tap room, a reminder of the ghastly spiders. The smell turns your stomach, and you motion Pido to follow you as you go up on deck to watch the barges dispose of the bodies. Contemptuously, they weigh Kezor's corpse with bricks and hurl it over the side. But trust, they lie on an oaken chest, and the captain leads your fellow passengers in a prayer as it's lowered respectfully into the f into Farron. The heavy rain and the burial have delayed the journey. The bargee trying to make up for lost time by whipping the Gorkas, but to no avail. The muddy tow path and their waterlogged fur prevent them from pulling any faster. It is mid-afternoon by the time the barge arrives at the next stopping place, the Ferry House. A ramshackle building is perched precariously on the edge of the riverbank, and the old wooden jetty juts out from the side, its empty platform almost submerged by the swollen river. Two Plains farmers disembark here. You hear they are talking excitedly about the events they have witnessed, their voices gradually fading as the barge moves forward again. Alright. You stare across the lush open plains that border the river, contemplating the quest that now lies, a that lies ahead. The flock of long-necked ochrils fly overhead, their melodic call echoing across the grasslands as they return to their nests at the river's edge. Paido sits silently beside you at the prow, his thoughts like yours on the perils of the Danarg uh, that they have that have yet to be faced. The sun is low in the sky when you catch sight of Tharo, its mud-colored walls thick, high, and crinolated? I don't know, dominating the hills on which they are built centuries ago. The barge passes beneath a stout wooden bridge supported by a rough hewn pillars of stone along a canal running parallel to the river and draws to a halt before two massive metal bound doors which span the waterway. You collect your horses and disembark with the other mounted passengers, riding in a line towards the fortified town gate. At first you are turned away by the guards, but you show them your pass, signed and sealed by Lord Adams. You are both ushered uh, to the front of the queue and saluted like lords as you ride through the archway and into the square beyond. Three streets converge at the Rivergate Square. Copperpiece Lane, Globe Walk, and Flagon Alley. Ooh, no Diagon Alley? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm kidding. You, okay. Alright, um, what do we want? Do we want Copperpiece Lane, Globe Walk, or Flagon Alley? Let's do Globe Walk. Or not. You follow the foot-worn cobbles of Globe Walk uh, past the premises of coopers, cobblers, and carpenters to an open square where you see a sign pointing to an alley that disappears among the shadows. Ahead, the street continues, flanked by shops and the town's perimeter wall. You wish to continue along the street? Do you wish to ride along the alley? Uh, because we want to go down an alley. Why? <laughs> Whatever. Let's do it. Hey, Pido, let's go down this suspicious-looking alley. I'm sure it'll turn out well. <sighs> Night is closing in, and the shops that lie in the narrow street are shutting their doors. Lanterns flare into life, uh, their yellow glow warming the chill west wind as the townsfolk return to their homes at the end of another day's trading. But there is one shop where the doors remain open. The sign hanging from the balcony reads, Roela Rada Mapmaker. Do you wish to enter the shop? Sure. Why not? I could use another map. <laughs> you are welcomed by an attractive young woman in lo with long jet black hair woven into a single plait that reaches almost to her waist. She is dressed in a green suede cloth tunic similar to her your own and wears soft calfskin gloves. In addition to the maps which she researches and draws herself, she also sells a manner of hunting and scouting equipment. She takes an obvious delight in her work and shows you samples of her maps, which are excellent for their accuracy and attention to detail. You ask her if she has ever prepared a map of the Danark, and she turns strangely silent. Tears begin to fill her eyes as she recalls how she and her father once explored beyond the fringes of the fearsome domain. They had planned to map its internal waterways and, if luck was with them, discover the lost temple of the Elder Magi. With sadness, she tells of her father's death at the jaws of a monster that, she had, that had stalked them from the moment they had entered the jungle swamp. She escaped, but not unscathed. She f fought to free her father from the mouth of the beast and was badly burned by its caustic saliva. 
Carefully, she removes one of her calfskin gloves and reveals an injured hand. The sight of the angry red scars fill you with compassion for this brave young woman. Oh, and there's a picture of the woman crying. I have healing! Can't I, like, heal the scars? Honestly. No? Okay, fine. I wish to ask her further questions about it, because we like making her cry more. <laughs> Unfortunately, she lost all her maps and equipment while escaping from the Dunark. However, she clearly recalls seeing the Temple of Rido from the peak of the hill she calls the Scarlet Tor, which is situated on an island of firm ground 30 miles beyond the Saida track. You thank her for her help and wish her good fortune before leaving the shop and continuing on your, on your way. You don't heal her at all with your magical healing. Whatever. <laughs> you arrive at a flagstone quadrangle. It is well lit by street lanterns which hang from the first floor balcony of a large and unusual building, constructed of blue stone, with silver and scarlet veins running through it. The bricks have been polished to give a mirror-like shine. A huge wooden door, banded with copper, dominates the entrance, above which a bronze cast depicts a flaming broadsword with the words, Temple of the Sword, engraved along the blade. Beyond the temple, the street ascends to a stone watchtower. It is built to the peak of the hill and dominates the town. If you have a map of Tharo, you may consult it before choosing any of the following options. I, do, I, don't, I don't have a map of Tharo. If you have the magic ideas to implement a plasmanship, I do! <laughs> How about that, guys? You chose right. To the left of the main door, you notice three symbols engraved in the speckled blue stone. A bed, a horse, and a loaf of bread. You recognize their significance, uh, for you have been to similar, seen similar markings on hostels and monasteries during your travels in the east. By displaying these symbols, the monks of the temple offer travelers a meal, stabling for their horses, and bed for the night. If you wish to take advantage of this offer, if you wish to stay here overnight, you can investigate the watchtower. Um, no, let's stay here for the night. Why would I want to go investigate a watchtower? You know, some of these, like, options, it's, like, so random. Hey, let's stay here for the night. I don't know, Pino. Why don't we go wa check out that watchtower? Why? I don't know. It could be, it could, you know, it could be people watching stuff there. Wouldn't you want to know? <laughs> you dismount and climb the steps leading to the temple doors. An old man in brown robes answers your knock and invites you and Pido inside. A novice attends to your horses. Stepping through the door is like stepping into another world. The air is sweet with incense, and f the flickering light cast by the long row of squat red candles does little to illuminate the interior. You follow the old man along the vaulted corridor, down several flights of stairs, and finally into a torchlit refractory. A delicious smell of cooking wafts from the open hatch in the wall, uh, together with the sounds of people in the kitchen beyond. Be seated, says the old man, pointing to a stout oak table laid for supper, and enjoy our humble food. May it, may it revive you after your travels and fortify you for the road ahead. Another monk enters the chamber carrying two steaming plates of meat stew. He sets them down before you and blesses your food with the words, Jakozutag. Wait, that sounds like, uh, that, I don't know, doesn't that sound like Gak language? Because, you know, I'm such an expert in Gak language. But I does have a lot of G's. If you are hungry after the day's journey, you must now eat a meal or lose three endurance points. If you wish to eat the appetizing stew, 10 page 336, if you wish to eat a meal from your backpack. Um. Um. Ah. Uh, so here's my only thinking. Of course I would just eat the stew, but that that those words, that these ones, the gag go zutag. That sounds like the gag language, doesn't it? Hang on. Oh, whatever. I'm going to uh trust my instincts, you know, because my gamer instincts help me so much. But, uh, yeah, that sounds suspicious, so I think I'm gonna eat a meal from my backpack. I have those. Um, but I don't want to insult them. You know, I'm not eating their food. I'll just say, I'm sorry, I'm a vegetarian, uh, who only eats dried meats. <laughs> Whatever, I'm gonna eat a meal from my backpack, because that's too suspicious, I think. 
Despite the tempting aroma, you push the meat stew away and settle for the dry provisions you carry in your pack. The monks appear upset by your refusal to eat their food. I'm vegetarian, I told you. Don't hate my religion. They whisper to each other and cast anxious glances at your untouched plate. Okay, you can eat it if you want. <laughs> Pido eats his stew, smiling delightedly as he fills his empty stomach. The monks hurry out of the refractory and return minutes later in the company of an elderly man dressed in a hooded black robe. He carries a long black staff. Have the vaqueros eaten? He asks, his voice strangely cold and monotonal. Oh, I'm sorry. Have the vaqueros eaten? Yes, master, replies the monks, but the Kai Lord refused. Hey, how do they know I'm a Kai Lord? <sighs> dun dun dun! Do you few possess the Magna Kai discipline of divination? Prepare to use it thoroughly, and I shall. Your skin prickles with a fearful premonition. You are in the presence of powerful evil! With pounding heart? You mean with like a pounding heart? Or do you have multiple pounding hearts, Lone Wolf? You rise from your seat in readiness for combat. If you have a bow and wish to use it. Yes, I do. I'm gonna shoot these. You're a hellgast, aren't you? I knew it! <laughs> Summon the brothers, commands the menacing figure in black. You draw an arrow and fire, felling one of the brown-robed monks as they rush to the door. The other escapes, slamming shut the door as he hurried to obey his master's order. If you wish to fire your bow at the remaining black-robed monk... Of course I do. Uh, I've used one arrow. I'm probably gonna use another one, aren't I? Uh, you draw and fire an arrow at the monk's head. At the same time, he spins his black staff with incredible speed and dexterity, creating a whirling whirl of darkness. There is a brief flash as your arrow enters the spinning vortex and is smashed into fragments. Aww. Before the fragments have settled to the floor, you shoulder your bow and draw a hand weapon and leap forward to catch your enemy off his guard. I guess that's two arrows down. Oh, wait. Where are all my arrows? I have, uh... I had five, so now I'm down to three arrows. Three. Alright. Let's attack! The sinister monk is shocked by the speed and ferocity of your attack, but he recovers his senses in time to parry your first blow with his black staff. A splash of hissing sparks light the room as your weapon scrapes along the jet black pole and glances off its twisted tip. You raise your arm to strike again, but you are distracted by Paido's scream of alarm. His face is deathly pale and his hands and arms are trembling uncontrollably. With a groan, he collapses. Scattered plates and cluttered and cultry, cutlery, sorry. As he hits the table and rolls unconscious to the floor. See? That's why you should be a vegetarian like me. That eats dried meat. Because that's what vegetarians do. A distant echoing whistle issues from the monk's open mouth. Steadily, it rises in pitch until it passes beyond the range of your hearing. At the moment, a terrible pain courses through your head. The pain and pressure grow until your skull feels as if it's ready to explode. Oh, great. Do you have a sight screen? <laughs> no, I definitely do not. Oh. Okay, to be honest with you, I don't remember exactly how many hit points I had lost, but I know it wasn't uh, more than numbered sections I've already passed, so we should be back up to 37. Uh, and I don't possess Psy screen. You fight to erect a mind shield to counter the searing pain of the psychic attack, but your defense is too weak to withstand the onslaught. You scream in agony as it assaults, as the assault cuts deep into the fabric of your mind. Lose eight endurance points? Good lord, that is expensive. Ah, well, I guess that's what you get for getting your mind torn apart. Anyone got some Advil? Could really use some. A ghastly transformation is taking place before your eyes. The monk's face is writhing and contorting as the skin tightens and grows darker. Tattered flesh drops from his sunken cheeks to hang in festoons beneath his exposed jawbone. A sickening dread fills your heart as you recognize the creature standing before you. It is a hellgast! I knew it! <laughs> Finally, after accusing people of being hellgasts, there actually is one! A nightmarish agent of the Dark Lords, the demonic eyes glow like red-hot coals as it shrieks and raises its long black staff. If you possess the Summer Sword, I do have that item, as a matter of fact. A cold blue fire burns at the tip of the Hellgaff staff, but the chill of its icy flame is thawed by the golden fire of the Sun Sword. Sword and staff collide with a deafening boom, and the crackling web of energy surrounds you both, scorching the refractory walls with a blistering intensity. Combat skill 38. Good lord, he is hard to kill. The creature is immune to mind blast, but I saw it not Psy Surge. Unless you possess the Magna Chi Discipline Psy Screen, you must reduce your combat skill by two points. 
Uh, here's a footnote. It seems peculiar that you are instructed to reduce combat skill at the beginning of every round if you do not have size screen. This loss would have been cumulative, so during the first round of combat, two fewer skill points. Hmm. Okay. Got it. So I just reduce it by two. And that's it. So it's not a cumulative effect or anything. 